Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Maria Ryan and I serve as Executive Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at the Colgate Palmolive uh, Company. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you, our listeners, to the eighth edition of Know Your O Cure, Know Your Oral Health Quotient with Colgate Palmolive, an educational health series which we have on LinkedIn. I'd like to open our conversation with a quick introduction of a very special guest today, who is not only the Dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, but a classmate of mine and a colleague for many years uh, from our alma mater at Stony Brook University, uh, Dr. Mark Wolf. And, and, and Dr. Wolf is the Morton Amsterdam Dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine and the professor in the Department of Preventive and Restorative Dentistry. And Dr. Wolf joined Penn Dental Medicine as the 12th Dean of the school in 2018. He is a celebrated teacher, globally engaged scholar, and deeply experienced clinician. Prior to joining Penn Dental Medicine, he was professor and chair of cardiology and comprehensive care at the College of Dentistry at New York University, and also the college's senior associate dean for development and alumni affairs. Dr. Wolf has designed, developed, and implemented an extensive curriculum in caries risk assessment and has designed dental information systems to assist dental schools in monitoring the risk of their entire dental population. He has served as the principal or co-principal investigator on multiple benchtop and clinical research projects, investigating dental caries, novel remineralizing agents, dental erosion, periodontal disease, dental materials, and dental hypersensitivity, with nearly $9 million in industrial and NIH-funded research. He's co-authored over 100 scientific papers. He's co-authored text chapters and edited multiple textbooks. And he lectures worldwide and is a frequent consultant to industry. He started his dental career as a private practitioner, creating a family practice that focused on oral health care for medically complex patients and persons with disabilities of all ages. And he's been a lifelong advocate and dental provider for individuals with physical, intellectual, and developmental disabilities throughout their lifespan. Welcome, Mark. It's such a pleasure to have you here uh, on Getting to Know Your OQ. Thank you so much, Maria, for having me. And thank you, Colgate, for doing this. This is just such an important program for the community to be able to to gain resources and knowledge, improving their oral health knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not only for uh, dentists and dental professionals, but other health professionals and consumers alike. And, you know, you have done just such an amazing job as the Dean of Penn at developing new and innovative programs. And, and one of them that is really of particular interest is the Center for Integrative Oral Health, which is led by Dr. Michael Glick. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about the important work being conducted at this new center at the University of Pennsylvania? So I like to, I like to classify this center as a center that uses best evidence to help inform the development of policies that can actually affect oral health for for globally millions of of people and this requires actually both the ability to synthesize and understand um the research the experiences that have been had but also to figure out how to apply these different experiences to individual communities. And, and it's much smaller than saying in the United States, a state or a nation. Um, there will be these micro environments that this policy will be the best policy for an area that doesn't have any dentists. And this one will be the, a best policy for an area that has 
has many dentists. Um, if there are no resources or if people don't have the abilities to do certain things, um, you have to take the research and the the studies that have been developed, um, understand the lived experiences of individuals and take those and combine them so that they can have um, actual outcome impact. This Center for Integrative Global Oral Health looks to do that at a very local level here in Philadelphia, a uh, larger national level in the United States, and globally um, looking at different areas of the world and 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 then that small microcosm within that environment what's the best evidence that that applies to your individual lived experiences on how to improve oral health reducing oral cancer periodontal disease um just the quality of your smile the ability to communicate eat prevent tooth decay there's just so much that we have to do that influences people's well-being and and figuring this out is it sounds simple but it's it's just such a complex task yeah it is very complicated and unfortunately oral health literacy is is quite low and and many people throughout the world do not understand the importance of oral health to overall health and well-being and that's why we initiated the program Know Your Oral Health Quotient. And, and I find it interesting that the center is really looking across the globe. And, and we were happy to, to sponsor the center's um, Global Oral Health Forum in Merida, Mexico, which brought uh, together international leaders to discuss new approaches to oral health equity. Could you share um, a little bit more about that meeting, which was a fabulous meeting? So as always, as a dean, I'm thankful for the people that that ha help support and make these things happen, because having these conversations are it's the beginning of making great policies that will will affect actual health. Um, because as as you intimated, you can't be healthy without having oral health at the same moment. That that just that just they're incompatible. We have to figure out how to improve the oral health of 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 a community, a nation, a, a, a globe, and that's just so important. This meeting at Merida actually brought together some of the thought leaders in a wide variety of areas, people that were experts in policy, people that were were expert that were that still are mm -hmm. experts in in oral health in certain areas, some individuals that are experts in the evidence, some people are experts at framing the problem. Um, uh, others are experts in in how to approach the disability community, the persons that have the lived experience of a disability. So we brought together this entire group, a very diverse group of international experts, and, and they did come from all around the world, um, to Merida, Mexico, where we sat in panels and and opened up questions and discussions on on how do you achieve oral health equity and in, in in the disability community for caregivers and for the individuals that that are unfortunately or, or fortunately living with disability? Um, we looked at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and universal health coverage. Um, World Health Organization and United Nations talked about a benefit for everybody globally. Uh, to address issues of of oral health, um, and and we talked about how that may or may not be possible. Um, it, there are countries that have three dentists per hundred thousand individuals. How do you adjust a workforce? to be able to make oral health. What other items do we have to address? Is it diet? Do we have to enroll our, our primary health care providers, our community health workers? How do we enroll people to, to help make this happen? We had extensive discussions on, on what we need to do with research and education, what we have here at Penn and what's been developed at other major universities throughout the world that can be shared so that 
other schools that don't have those same resources don't have to invest them. We can share that knowledge. What research has been done in one locality? Do you have to do it again in this one if we have the identical situations? And we actually talked about, about addressing that. And last, we talked about this workforce issue. As I said, there are areas where there are no classic dentists, but but people are still exposed to oral health issues. How do we how do we get how do we get a primary care nurse to look under the tongue for cancer um, in in people that are smoking? Uh, how do we get dentists? and oral health care providers to talk about human papillomavirus, HPV, um, a preventable condition that, that with a vaccination that essentially eliminates oropharyngeal cancer. Um, how do we address issues of periodontal disease and, and, and the inflammation that that causes throughout the body affecting diabetes and heart and stroke? potentially Alzheimer's disease, at the same time getting people that are treating those conditions to think about oral health and can we make everybody better? It's such an exciting, it's such an exciting moment, but there's just so many areas that we have to we have to start working in and recognize that what's done in a high resource environment, is not necessarily applicable to what you're going to do in a lower resource environment. Yeah, it is a very complex issue. And, and I think it is so important to bring the, the people together who can help to facilitate change and, and break down silos that exist, yep. you know, between government and, 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 and those policymakers and, and industry and academia and other healthcare providers. And, and so it was really an excellent forum to do that. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. You talk about countries where there may not even be any oral health care providers. And, and, you know, we have programs where we train students um, to do the research and, and to help in their communities. And one of our graduates from our, uh, LATAM Dental Health Unit in Latin America and Brazil uh, it actually has returned to his country of Mozambique, where he is the only dentist, PhD, periodontist in the whole country uh, of Mozambique. So, um, you know, you're about to hold a meeting in Kenya called Idea Africa, which will focus on the oral health issues which the African continent uh, faces. So could you tell us a little bit more about this upcoming meeting? Well, that's that's an exciting meeting. And we've we, we've used this whole team of people that we've assembled to do some novel things. We started out by doing a scoping review at looking at what research has been done on the African subcontinent. And we're doing this in concert with the World Health Organization's Africa Group and WHO defines Sub-Saharan Africa. So the Morocco, Algeria, Libya, that actually is part of the Middle East group. And, and we're following the, the um, WHO uh, World Health Organization designations. So we've actually gone to the health ministries, the schools. Um, we've actually, we have one of the most extensive lists of oral health education institutions in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it was a simple question like, what are the dentals? Nobody actually knew where, what, who's teaching oral health? So we've put all of this information together. We're inviting the educators because we'd like to crux this in education, but where there are no educators, we're inviting health ministers and, and dental health ministers, uh, you know, chief dental offices where possible. And we're actually going to talk about, you know, so what's the evidence that's already been published out of, out of sub-Saharan Africa by people in sub-Saharan Africa? What is that microcosm that I spoke about, that little, you know, is it applicable in multiple areas? How can we do this? How can we address policies that will rightfully expand workforce? And I don't necessarily mean um, 
building dental schools that that do the the European or American image of of four or six years in school. Rather, you know, is this taking a community health worker or a primary care nurse and expanding their knowledge about oral health? so that they can work on this. Is this working with a public health organization, a non-governmental organization in, in a country to, to increase knowledge about processed sugar and, and its role in causing tooth decay? Um, it's, you know, you're a toothpaste company um, in, in large part. It's not easy in many areas where where a family may work for a week or two weeks to buy a toothbrush and toothpaste. The common solutions that I might suggest here in the United States don't roll off the tip of the tongue in, in areas that have low resources. So we're going to have the discussions about where the research has been and what it looks like today um, that might be usable in a low resource, a moderate resource, or a high resource area and try and encourage the health ministries to, to, to pick for the microcosm the best evidence. And where there's no evidence, let's help make the simplest research possible to, to get the answer to what will work best for your community. Um, so it's an ambitious attempt to, to take a, a very... Um, economically diverse um, region of the world and and share the knowledges. You know, there are countries that have no dental schools or oral health training facilities. There are company, countries that have 10 and 12 of them. Um, how do we take the knowledge that's here and share it so that everybody doesn't have to invent the wheel again, but rather can take the next building block and, and actually get to improving smiles, decreasing pain, keeping kids in school and 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 adults at work and and improving nutrition at the same time. Uh, you know, I mentioned you know sugar is sugar is a problem for diabetes, ob obesity, hypertension, heart disease and tooth decay. Absolutely. Absolutely. The diet we can have a common discussion. It's essential. Yes. And, you know, I, I think, you know, what you're saying is so important in that, you know, resources are scarce. And, and, if, and if we can all work together and share, then we can get so much more done. And, and I think all of these efforts really highlight the convening power of the team that you've built at the University of Pennsylvania to bring, you know, all the parties together so that we can share and that we can save on the, some of the scarce resources that are there. You know, with the time remaining, I, I'd actually like to talk a little bit about um, all of your years of being an advocate for people with disabilities. Um, it's really, Mark, throughout your entire career, uh, this has been an area of, of passion for you. Um, and, you know, we're talking about basically health equity, oral health equity, and it's in, I think in no other population is uh, that uh, more needed than any place else, really. Um, and so you have built a, a much needed care center for people with disabilities at, at the University of Pennsylvania. So can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing there? So um, this does come out of a lifetime commitment. Um, uh, both you, Maria, and I had a, a fantastic faculty who taught this to us as dental students. And and frankly, I didn't know that this was anything special. Uh, I, I went out to practice and, and started practicing, working on the people that lived in and around my community who needed, needed aesthetic dentistry done or came to me in a wheelchair or had a health disability or an intellectual disability. And these things can happen to us um, uh, through a normal aging process. Uh, we, we, we all as, as humans know uh, a family that's had somebody that's aged and, and developed a, 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 a dementia or an Alzheimer's disease, a Parkinson's disease. It can happen from trauma, um, auto accidents, a motorcycle accident. 
um, it can happen from birth and it, it can be a, it, it can be something that happened early in life that resulted in, in an intellectual disability that, or a physical disability that influenced, um, the segment of the population is the fastest growing segment, um, globally and in the United States, uh, the numbers of people are so tremendous that the thought of saying we'll get specialists to take care of this or we'll send these patients to an operating room is just not a practical method. Um, understanding the use of prevention and fluorides and discussions with caregivers about about sugar and prevention and you know somebody doesn't somebody doesn't children don't have the ability to go get cookies on their own they have to be they don't go to the store and buy them they have to be facilitated in some fashion how can we educate people better and and get our current dental community to address at least the arresting of tooth decay, the the prevention of new tooth decay, and then the restoration of health on 95% of the individuals. So we built a care center that's designed to deliver the very best in, in world-class care to the patients. And we hear every day from patients that say, I, I didn't know this existed or was possible. Um, but at the same time, it's to educate the next generation of dentists so they can go out and and treat patients in wheelchairs and they're not afraid. I, we had a patient who came in and and said they couldn't get care because they were deaf. A dentist said, I don't treat deaf patients. How is, how is that? It doesn't fit nicely inside my heart. So um, we're trying to teach our students how to find the accommodations that make good health prevention and communication possible for persons with a very wide group of disabilities. We're offering a massive free, uh, a free of charge to dentists globally. Colgate's been so helpful in in promoting it, but there's a, a tremendous no cost to the pay to the to the person um, continuing education for uh, dentists, dental hygienists, dental assistants, staff people in offices, so they can understand the value of what we're doing. Um, and and you know at the same time, you know through the the generosity of Colgate, we've launched a a tremendous research area because, um, you know, I can, I can so easily say that, you know, the flavor of things is not the same for every individual. Absolutely. And literally the flavor of things is not the same for every individual and nobody's actually wandered down these research areas, you know, whether it's a person on the autistic spectrum who can't brush their teeth, can we find a method of motivating it? Or somebody that has horrendous arthritis and can't hold the brush, how can we assist in, back to that statement I made about um, arrest the current disease, prevent future disease, and then restore function? How can we help that patient achieve that um, with themselves or caregivers as necessary? And our students, our patients have just been so open and welcoming to this education. Um, it, it's been a wonderful, I, I mean, I go up there and have, have difficulties at time not getting teary seeing the, the, the amazing it's, work it's that they're dramatic. doing. Yeah, they are doing amazing, amazing work. And, you know, we, we're very proud to have uh, put in a Colgate Innovation Laboratory there to to really help in the development of products to address the needs of the patients and their caregivers 
in trying to um, facilitate preventive strategies because in this you know population prevention is essential and you know engaging um, people um, if, I think you mentioned we we did a study with you in, in in children with autism and used augmented reality on a toothbrush to engage kids who may otherwise, an ABA specialist may have taken them a year to teach them and get them interested in brushing. So we can develop technologies together that actually move the needle for them. And and you might want to comment on it because you ran that study. So it was a, it yeah. was a very interesting study. We're preparing to, the publication is ready for submission at this moment. Um, the absolutely wonderful uh, thing is that that we saw caregivers and the patients themselves um, find a method of of um, getting people to brush longer and more thoroughly um, using this augmented reality in 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 the toothbrush um, using a, a a cell phone or an iPad as the the platform and and the 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 patients, the patients walked away smiling after after participating in toothbrushing, where so many of them actually, many of them would never allow somebody to even get near them to brush. So this is this is just a dramatic. It's a to me, it's a wow moment, um, and that's using a technology and and the support of Colgate has been so instrumental in in making the center and bringing the openness to to the question of well what about this could we do that and will that have a different effect you know that's that's wow i i mean every day i i think about that and the number of things that we're we're going well can we take a look at this and the patients, the caregivers, the students are so utterly engaged in in how to go do this and and realizing that um, every one of us, and if there was a takeaway for for the dentists and and dental practices, every one of you has has these skills inside. It doesn't take much to make it happen. We just have to we just have to facilitate that. and that's that's. It's wow. It's wonderful. That's great, Mark. And, and that's usually my last question. What What are the one or two takeaways? And, and one of them you just mentioned is that everybody has the ability to, to really contribute and make a difference, not only for people with disabilities, but in general, for people who may not have access uh, to care and, and educating people. So are there any other takeaways you want to add to that? So, you know, and it it probably encapsulates my career, which started, as you said, as a truly a private practitioner and went into education and then eventually wound me in in the chair as the leader of of one of the world's top dental schools. Um, anything is possible and and the greatest gratification that that is possible is is helping others achieve things they didn't know they were capable of doing. And um, as dentists, um, we are given this gifted career to be part of. Um, as practitioners that patients trust, um, we can we can radically alter their health in, in so many ways, in things that that had little or nothing to do with dentistry, if we show the interest. And and if there was anything I I could ask of of people anywhere in the world in the health profession, it would be to stretch your wings and try and and improve the lives and health of everybody around you. Um, we're blessed in having the ability to make people smile. It's what we do as a profession. So you know this is this is is really great. And and seeing an organization like Colgate take a take not more than an interest take a role in in helping make people understand all of this um helping practitioners get better at delivering this type of 
of whole health. You know, that that's incredible. I thank you and Colgate for doing this. I'm, I'm on it and so pleased to be able to be part of the process. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for all that you and all of your colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have done to, to not only educate the next generation of practitioners, but also to do the research and the advocacy work all with an emphasis on improving the oral and overall health of people, not only within your community, but throughout the world. So thank you, Mark. And I look forward to hearing about all the good things because we only touched upon a little bit of the progress that you've made there at Penn. So maybe we'll have you back on to talk about some of the other really awesome things you're doing there. So thanks, Mark. We're having a great time helping people. And um, we thank our partners at Colgate for helping facilitate that and and make make this possible for people. Uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Colgate.